Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as Antonio just mentioned, we're going to be talking about software citation practices in the digital humanities community. Um, I would like to start off by mentioning two members of the team uh, which we are representing here today, and that's Daniel Lietka and Anna Ferga from the University of Paderborn. Daniel is actually here at the conference with us, actually here in the front. So uh, while Ulrike and I are very happy to take any of your questions in the Q&A session, you can also talk to any of the three of us during the coffee break and we'll be happy to discuss further. It's also worthwhile uh, to mention that this is actually the continuation of a work started by Daniel and Ludike, uh, analyzing the software citation practices in the DHD um, abstracts, uh, co conference abstracts, which is actually really good that uh, Patrick already explained how it all works and the whole uh, environment of the conference and how the abstracts are produced and made available. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's start. First, let's take a quick look at the overview of what we'll be discussing today. We'll be talking about software citation, oh, software and digital humanities, so um, the importance, the relevance, and also um, the use cases, some of them, software citation principles and recommendations that fundament our work uh, that we're presenting, the corpus and annotation criteria that we have used, annotation analysis and results, and finally, conclusions and considerations on further steps. So to start off, software in the digital humanities. I'm a bit afraid that I'm preaching to the choir here um, after this week, also all, all of the talks that we have seen. But software has definitely um, positioned itself as a central piece of the workflow across all fields, not only digital humanities. We use it from the most simple cases, such as writing our text in, I don't know, Word or, or open source software, making presentations with PowerPoint to very much more complex usages, such as developing your own software for your research purposes or even adapting research software that already exists for producing research results. Um, software plays a central as well in digital humanities, I guess that's pretty obvious, for digitization, exploration and analysis of data sets, enabling of new methods, publication of digital data, and we have seen that this week a lot. Uh, there is uh, OCR, HDR, uh, NLP, and I could go on and just go over the time just by mentioning the amazing research that has been presented here this week. And one thing that we also like in the age is visualizations. So I brought a very simple one of just to, to uh, exemplify how important software has been for us, for the community this week. So this is a pie graph showing the abstracts of this conference of this year that somehow mention or allude to software. So I just generated that by comparing the abstracts against a list of keywords that I set just to show um, if they mention one of these keywords, it already counts as, a soft, uh, as an abstract that's somehow alluding to software. I know this is very abstract, but it's just to start off the conversation today. And of course, we're not talking about PowerPoint, we're not talking about Word, we're talking about research software, which we understand as software that is used in research to generate, process, analyze, link, or present research data. And we also see research software in a broad scope, so that means that it's, we consider both software that was developed in research context, but also software that was developed elsewhere and used in research. Why is important then to cite this type of software? Well, it guarantees transparency. It guarantees that the community knows exactly which processes we have uh, taken, which steps we have taken to produce the research results that we're, we're presenting and uh, creating. It enables reproducibility, and it allows us to give proper credit to developers, which is a very important theme, and it was discussed and mentioned many times also already in this week, and I would emphasize the panel of research software engineer that happened yesterday, this was uh, something that was really mentioned and, and strongly mentioned by the research software engineers in the panel. And it's also allowing us to maintain stable reference, for example, to a particular version of a software that we use. With that in mind, our goal today is to review the practice of software citation in the digital humanities, raise awareness and promote adequate identification, acknowledgement and tracking of software as a scholarly tool and output. Moving on then to the software citation principles and recommendations that the community has already produced. We start off with the question, when to cite software? And here I took two questions that um, kind of orient us a little bit 
questions we can ask ourselves when we are dealing with software in a publication. Did the software play a critical part in my research or did the software provide something novel? So when the software is closely related to the production of the research results or the processes that lead us to research results, that's important to cite. And what type of recommendations already exist? So the research guides and software citation in particular, they address how to cite software very directly, but there are also recommendations that are part of general guides of sustainable software development that see proper citation as a sustainability measure that we all should attain to. And we also considered, and the authors also considered, recommendations from general citation styles that we already use anyways for publishing, uh, for citing and referencing books and papers and so on, like MLA or APA. The recommendations made by software develop developers themselves for their software is always very important. We should also consider that and try to look for that information when we're citing software. And yet another visualization of the literature that's available with software citation recommendations or uh, recommendations for sustainable software development. And this is just to show that for some pieces of information are considered to be important across uh, all of these recommendations and publications. For example, naming your software. I know it sounds obvious, but we have found that it's not always the case that people remember to say the name of the software that they used. Um, the authors and developers, I already mentioned, I think that two times, three times that it's super important, I will mention it again. It is super important to give proper credit to people who put intellectual work into developing these softwares. Version number, of course, is very important so that we can really track back and see which version of the software was used to produce those results so that there are no inconsistencies. And the persistent identifier that should really um, maintain a uh, identification of a unique identification of the software throughout time even when the software is no longer available. Was there anything else? Yeah, yeah, sorry. We also uh, considered the six principles for citing research software from Smith from 2016, and these are important, and that uh, relates to considering software a legitimate and citable product of research, credit and attribution. Once again, see how important that is, uh, properly um, giving uh, recognition and credit to people. Unique identification relates to creating machine actionable um, identifiers that are also used and recognized by the community. So for instance, in our case, that would be, could be the DOI. Persistence, which means using a stable identifier that persists throughout time. Accessibility, meaning that we should describe, document, um, provide metadata for about the software that we have used or produced. And this is uh, guaranteeing an informed use of the reference software. So when I see that in a publication, I can inform myself exactly what that does, uh, what it can serve for me, and so on and so forth. And the specificity, uh, which means um, making the specific version that was used clear. We come then to the corpus and the criteria of uh, the presentation today. Our goals, as I mentioned, were to review the practice of software citation in the digital humanities through an analysis based on DH conference abstracts with an annotation model that developed, were, was developed from existing software citation recommendations and also the principles. And as I also mentioned in the beginning, this is based on preliminary work by uh, Daniel and Ulrike, analyzing the software citation practices in the digital humanities abstracts from the German-speaking conference. Sorry. So this leads us to the central question here, how is software cited, which information is given, or which information is omitted, which is what we want to show with this presentation. The corpus we work with, as I mentioned, is the volumes of conference abstracts of the DH conference, so this, this conference from 2015 through 2020 in TI format, meaning that we did not use uh, the abstracts from 2017 because of the format. They were not in TI. So we randomly selected 156 abstracts for manual annotation in all languages. So uh, English, Spanish, French, German, Italian, and Portuguese were annotated and considered. And we also took uh, abstracts from all the relevant years. The characteristics of the criteria, criteria we use to annotate the software are these on the slide. So it's in line with software citation principles. It's in line with software citation recommendations. It is modeled as a TEI taxonomy, and it's available to you all on GitHub. 
end, there it is. So on the left hand side of the table, you can see the labels that we're, used to, we're using to, to annotate uh, the abstracts and then a description. So we have, for instance, DivSoft, which is when a bibliographic entry for the software itself is used to reference the software in the abstracts. And that's different than, for instance, the BibRef, which is when a bibliographic reference uh, was used to reference a publication about the software, so a journal article, book, or a user manual about the software. Then we have name only, when only the name of the software is mentioned somehow there, so we use this thing and then moves on, doesn't explain anything else. Um, agent uh, is when the developers or responsible persons are mentioned. Then we have URL, that's also obvious, that's when a URL is used to point to the software. Um, Persis persistent identifier, so a DOI, as I mentioned, and the version, the version of the software when it's uh, explicitly uh, referenced there. Okay, so now I will give the word to Ulrike. <laughs> Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, so now we continue with the actual annotation process um, and the results we, uh, we got. Uh, we opted um, for creating a manual list of software in the first place, and we also used the tool extractor to find potential software citations as a help. Uh, it also works with the software lists and detects the, the name softwares in uh, the abstracts, and that was post-processed a lot manually. Um, we know there are uh, also approaches, uh, um, for example, also machine learning based approaches to identify software names. Uh, we didn't use those because we really wanted to look at the parts of citation information very closely and uh, get a sense of how this is done and uh, not only find uh, software in general uh, in the abstracts. Um, here you see an, uh, one of our examples. So we directly annotated in the TI files of the abstracts. Um, as you can see, here's one paragraph uh, and a sentence where uh, the software is mentioned two times. Um, now, it's in Spanish. I'll try to, to phrase uh, what's said. It said that uh, indexes were generated with a complement called reference, which is uh, a complement for the software Omeka, which was developed by Daniel Bertereau. And in the bibliography of that abstract, there was a reference uh, to the software, directly to the software. So the developer was named. Uh, there was no date given, but the specific version and the name of the module and a link to GitHub. And um, in our first approach uh, that we present here today, uh, we um, annotated the, the mention of the software in the text, but not in the bibliography. So we are only annotated it once and then collected all the information in that place. Uh, as you can see here, the RS type software for reference has in the ANA attribute uh, the various information. So the agent, the version, the URL, and BibSoft, because we have a direct um, entry in the bibliography for the software itself. And the second mention, uh, not of the, the module, but of Omeka, uh, this is only given by name. So there's no general reference for the Omeka software in this case. Um, and you can see that uh, every mention can be connected to several uh, types of elements of, of citation. Um, we had a lot, of, a lot of discussions in the annotation process um, to think about what to annotate and uh, what not, and we did this very broadly here. So any type of computer program was considered, including desktop or web applications service software, plugins, extensions, and also sets of scripts. And we saw that the type of software is really, really diverse uh, that's used and referenced in the abstract. And uh, we take concrete mentions, but also references to software in the main text, as I said. So um, uh, most often software was named with a name, some but sometimes there was also only a bibliographic reference without naming the software. Uh, programming languages were a bit difficult, something like Python, JavaScript. Uh, of course, you, you wouldn't um, name the developers in these cases, but to give a specific version is important here too, uh, to say what, what version you have worked with. So this is kind of a special case. Um, so we also uh, take them in, um, to have everything uh, in our annotations. Uh, and then we created a central software index 
where we collected all the different software instances that we found in the selected um, abstracts. And currently in this index, there are 181 entries. Uh, here you see how the index looks like. Um, so we have an XML ID, which is then used um, in the abstracts um, to point to um, and identify the software that was annotated. We uh, collect, try to collect the names, uh, a URL, a short description if available, and started to categorize the software, but this has not been finished for all the entries yet. And it's also not always easy. Uh, so categorization can be what kind of software do we have, and is it general software used in research, or is it research software developed in a research uh, project? So this will be a future work to look more closely uh, to the categories in, in our software index. And as you can see here, um, there are really different kinds. So MediaWiki would be a very general software, which is often not cited with all the information. Poetry Lab is a specific DH software uh, where it makes uh, is, um, much more sense to really look at all the information cited properly. And um, the last case is one where there was not a name. There's a paper in which results produced with research uh, software are presented, um, but there was no publication of, uh, at least we didn't find a publication of the software itself and not a specific name uh, for it. Now I come to the results of our uh, analysis. Here you see a table showing the different um, parts of the citation information um, and their absolute uh, frequency in the abstracts as well as their relative frequency. Um, now I have to explain that um, as software is often mentioned multiple times in the abstracts, we decided to count each occurrence of a type only once. So if there was, the abstracts are short and if there was one um, mention of the agents or one mention of the version, uh, this criterion counted as, uh, as met. Um, and if it occurred a second time, we didn't count it again. Um, yes, and um, here you see that 70% um, are name only mentions, so only the, the name of the software is mentioned. And then um, with 23%, there are the bibliographic references, but uh, of papers of the software and not the software itself. Um, URLs are also often given in the fifth of the cases, um, but uh, references in the bibliography of uh, software, setting software directly, is rare with only 6% um, that the agents are explicitly mentioned and that the persistent identifies is even more uh, more rarely, and also versions are rarely, um, rarely given. Uh, we also tried to do this over time. You see that 2017 is not included here as we didn't use these abstracts. Um, and um, yes, we see the distribution, but no clear progression or no clear um, development um, of the information. So uh, apparently there has not been a type of development of um, the software citation um, process. Uh, I come to the conclusions. We see a need for improvement of software citation practice in the age, uh, a need for action. And action by users, um, users would be the researchers using existing software, citing it in their papers, but also uh, need for action by developers and operators and by publishers, because developers, if they provide all the relevant information, uh, if they create releases with a version, if they create a persistent identifier, it must be created by developers uh, to be citable. That's also very important. And publishers can help if they have citation guidelines. Um, I, I mean publishers of journals, um, also the guidelines for this conference, for example, if there is a category of software and a recommendation on how, uh, how to cite it. Um, here's just a short summary for what we recommend um, based on everything that we heard also from other people. Uh, the first thing, publish your software um, and name your software. So often, in the age, this, um, in the abstracts, there are sentences like, we, did a, uh, we developed a set of scripts in Python. Why not give it a name and publish it? Then it can be cited uh, more easily. And um, create citation suggestions. This is easily possible on GitHub, for example, using uh, citation file format files. 
which can then be machine readable and read by humans as well, um, and create persistent identifiers, for example, on, um, on the, in the Zenodo archive. For users, we recommend to use bibliographic entries for the research software itself. Um, I would briefly li uh, like to say why, because um, a paper can become old after some years. If you still cite the same paper, it's not about the software as it is at, at that point anymore. And also, who are the developers? That can also change over time. So if you cite the software directly, it's more probably you really um, give credit to the people involved at that point. Uh, name the responsible persons and institutions and be specific. So if you use, if it's relevant that you use the specific module uh, or version, then cite that. Um, and also use persistent identifiers if they are uh, there. Um, to uh, finish, here's just one example how that could look like. Maybe that could be introduced into the submission guidelines uh, in the, for the DH validator because there's no example of software yet in it. Uh, it's just having the names of the developers, um, having a year, the name of the software, a version, um, and a link or a DUI. Um, and this is the general pattern that how it would look like. It's not difficult. Um, yes, and uh, of course, we uh, would like to continue our work. Um, we want to continue by annotating not only abstracts, but also journal articles, so longer texts, um, also revise our annotation model, and there will be an upcoming contribution to the TIMC conference um, in September. Um, and we want to be a bit more professional in the annotation process, so calculate inter-annotator agreement. We didn't do that for this analysis. Um, and uh, we would also try to get more data by training a model than with our existing uh, annotations. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, we are looking forward to your questions. Thank you.